Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the most recent professional education event hosted by CBM and the firm's financial advisory subsidiary, MBI. Today's one-hour session is entitled, What is the Son of Secure Legislation and How Could It Impact Your Retirement? And our speakers today are Judy Barnhard and Alex Seleznev. Uh, Judy is a partner at CBM and a director of the firm's wealth management, financial planning, and professional services groups. She is also a senior advisor and chief compliance officer at MBI. In her role as a certified planner and a CPA, Judy consults on retirement planning, estate planning, income tax preparation and planning, cash flow and budgeting, and risk management. She is also a regular presenter for CBM's financial planning webinars, including most recently, Maximizing Social Security Benefits and Avoiding Mistakes on July 22nd, and before that, Medicare and Medicaid, What Should I Know Now and in the Future on February 23rd. Uh, Alex is a partner, senior advisor, and portfolio strategist at CBM and MBI. He's a certified financial planner and a chartered financial analyst who leads the firm's investment management division. Uh, Alex's professional focus is on comprehensive financial planning and investment management. In addition to today's session on the Son of Secure Legislation, he's a regular presenter for the firm and is next scheduled to co-present in a September 21st webinar entitled Grow Your Net Worth, Top Strategies and Opportunities for Mid-Career Professionals. So we're hoping you'll join us for that. Uh, he was also quoted in April for the second consecutive year in a Kiplinger's article about searching for yields in a low-yield market. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us once more. Thank you for submitting questions during the registration process that have been shared with our presenters and have been incorporated into the presentation. If you have any other questions during the presentation today, please use the chat box and Judy and Alex will respond to them. Uh, today's session is being recorded and everyone who's participating will get a copy of the slides. Uh, if you are participating using your phone, please email me or Marissa, who you would have received an RSVP reminder about this event for, uh, just so we know who you are and we can get you the presentation slides. And with that, I'm going to turn it over now to Judy and Alex. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit about MBI, um, for those of you who are perhaps less familiar um, with what we do. Um, so we're a fee-only comprehensive financial plan and investment advisory group. Um, we are a subsidiary of CBM. Um, anytime we work with our clients, we always serve as a fiduciary, and that's important, important for us and for our clients. Uh, well, that, of course, eliminates many potential conflicts of interest. Um, as of now, we manage close to 350 million on a discretionary basis and close to 400 million on non-discretionary basis. Um, our team consists of seven. We have seven professionals dedicated to this work. We have five certified financial planners or CFPs. We have two uh, chartered financial analysts, um, one of them. And we're actually really hoping that one of our teammates will become a CFA soon. Um, and CBM as a firm, we have more than 40 CPAs. And that is actually what makes us unique. Um, we're one of those few firms in the area that is able to provide all three services in-house. We do not outsource any of it, meaning tax planning, tax preparation, um, creation of financial plans or financial planning, and of course, investment management. Um, so that is there's our core service, but we, we provide the services on hourly basis as well. Um, and we can also focus on issue specific engagements such as retirement planning, college planning, estate planning, um, a variety of different things. So if you want to learn more, feel free to reach out to Judy or myself, or of course, visit our website um, on the bottom of this slide. So with that, let's get started. Um, so before we dive into the son of secure, you know, secure act 2.0, I thought it would be useful, at least to some of you, uh, to recap the original secure act of 2019. Uh, so these are some of the most important things that were addressed um, again in the original act. Um, so one of the important things is the, um, uh, so-called re uh, required minimum distribution age or RMD age was pushed from seven and a half to 72 for those who were not um, seven and a half by the end of 2019. So in, in, in practice, essentially it pushed your required minimum distributions by two years and it gave people more time to plan and you know, save for retirement. It also eliminated the maximum age for traditional IRA contributions. It was capped at seven and a half 
at the time. Uh, now, if you're you know, 73, 74 years old or older and you're still working, um, you have enough earned income to make a contribution in your traditional IRA, you can um, continue doing so again. So the idea is to encourage um, savings. Now, one of the perhaps most controversial part of the original SECURE Act and where we spent most of the time you now discussing with our clients is the elimination of the stretch IRA provision. So prior to the original SECURE Act, one of the you know, important planning strategies, not just in the financial planning side, but also in the estate planning side, was that let's say you know you have a large IRA, you have a large 401k, you're not necessarily planning on spending the, the funds throughout your lifetime. So one of the strategies you would have is is for your beneficiaries. In many cases, it would be your children to inherit those let's say larger accounts and then stretch the required minimum distributions from those accounts over their lifetime. So if you can envision if someone is you know, 30, 40 years old, inheriting, let's say, a million dollar account, um, of course, there are very significant tax benefits for stretching over that person's lifetime. So that was eliminated. Uh, now uh, you have 10 years to distribute the, the funds from the inherited IRA. Uh, there's still some flexibility in place, meaning you can take the funds out in year one, which is rarely advisable. Um, you can wait all the way to year 10, you know, wait for the funds to grow and then take the funds out, or perhaps take it in you know, approximately equal or not so equal installments um, throughout the 10 year period. There are some exceptions, you know, for surviving spouses, minor children, um, disabled or chronically ill beneficiaries or beneficiaries who are less than 10 years younger than the original owner, meaning usually it would be your siblings, your sisters and brothers. Um, some, a couple other things um, in terms of the 529 college savings accounts, uh, up to $10,000 can now be used for qualified student loan repayments, so that benefited some people. And then for those who um, have significant medical expenses, um, the threshold um, for, for the medical deduction was actually lowered back to 7.5% of the adjusted gross income or AGI, it was at 10%. So these are some of the most important aspects of, original, of the original SECURE Act. So the SECURE Act 2.0 or the, the son of SECURE, whichever you prefer. So the formal title is the SECURE and a Strong Retirement Act, but you know, if you ask me, if you ask me that two weeks from now, I'll probably forget that. I just refer to it as the Secure Act. Um, it's a 150-page document, so it's relatively large or relatively small, depending on what you're comparing it to. Um, and today, we wanted to discuss some of the major highlights of again of the Secure Act 2.0 um, in terms of your required minimum distributions, catch-up contributions with Roth tax treatment, that's very interesting, um, the so-called qualified longevity annuity contracts or QLAC rules, um, QCD rules or qualified charitable distribution rules, uh, prohibited transactions, and then qualified student loan payments. And that is actually a very interesting provision. So we'll start with the required minimum distributions or again, RMDs. So the idea here, here is relatively straightforward is to gradually you know, push back the RMD age from 72 to 75. And when I actually read it the very first time and I got excited, I was like, oh wow, it's from 72 to 75. But unfortunately, um, this is going to be happening over a period of 10 years. So this is not an immediate from 72 to 75. Um, so assuming it passes as it stands, um, um, yeah, the RMD age would be 73 next year as of January 1st of 2022, um, 74 starting on January 1st of 2029, and then 75 essentially in 2032. So you would benefit from this provision the most, assuming again it passes as it stands, if you are 64 or younger in 2021. So that's that's that. Now, is that is that good or bad? I mean, let's let's talk about it. So one way of thinking about it, well, let's say again, you have a larger IRA or larger um, 401k. Well, you delay all the way, let's say to age 75. Well, perhaps as a result of that, your taxes, you know, in your retirement start at age 75 in my example, would be higher. So what we frequently do, and I refer to it as, um, so I refer to them as artificially um, low income years, we try to come up with strategies to prevent that from happening. 
and I'll just I'll just make an example here. Let's say we work with a client who's 65 years old, you know, ready to retire. Um, let's say that person is not planning on taking his or her social security um, all the way to age 70. And let's say under the Secure Act 2.0, the RMD is now age 75. So we have 10 years to work with to, to do what? To do potential Roth conversions in lower tax brackets. Perhaps we would want to take some capital gains in those you know, five to 10 years um, so that that person pays taxes at, um, in, in lower brackets. Perhaps we're working on restructuring that person's portfolio to make it more tax efficient. So again, those five to 10 years um, would give us um, essentially a longer opportunity to do so um, versus age 72. So that's certainly a positive. Um, well, from a different perspective, when we were you know, preparing for this webinar, uh, what I discovered is that only 20% of retirees um, actually limit their you know, IRA or 401k or 403b distributions to their RMD amount, which basically means that the remaining 80% um, take more than that. So, well, in some sense, if you find yourself in a situation when you're you know, 68 years old, you need to take some funds out of your IRA, well, this will not necessarily benefit you all that much. But overall, this is, this is certainly a positive uh, because again, from the planning perspective, it provides more flexibility. Uh, the other piece that is perhaps not very well known, and I, I'll tell you many, many people are not even aware, is that if you actually miss your RMD, you know, there's a, there's a pretty steep penalty of 50%, you know, currently. And, you know, usually the, the applicable deadline is December 31st of the year when it's due. So again, if you miss it, if you forgot, or you just were, were not aware, you still need to take it out. You still need to pay your regular taxes, but there's also a 50% penalty. So under the Secure Act 2.0, uh, that penalty is now it will be reduced to 25%. And if you fix that mistake in a timely manner, presumably within a few months, um, the, the tax or the penalty would be reduced to 10%. So that's, that's clearly a positive. There's not much to really say about it. Again, please be aware of this, first of all, and if you, if you ever miss it, well, the penalty would be less. So the catch-up contributions with Roth tax treatment. So this is where, again, when I was reviewing different different articles and um, secure act 2.0 this is where i actually spent the most time here so before we dive into this just very briefly with regular traditional ira contributions anytime you make a contribution uh, there's a tax deduction dollar for dollar essentially reduces your taxable income the funds that you contribute in your traditional ira or 401k are growing tax deferred meaning that when you actually begin to take the funds out, you would be paying taxes at your ordinary income tax rates at the time. So these are tax deferred accounts. With Roth 401k, Roth IRA accounts, there's no tax break. There's no tax deduction when you make a contribution. Essentially, you're making contributions with your after-tax monies, but then the entire growth is essentially tax-free. Because you know, if slash when you tap into those accounts, there are no taxes to pay. So of course, there are a lot of strategies here. So here's the first bullet point. Um, the IRA catch-up contributions, Roth and traditional, would be indexed for inflation. So currently, there are $1,000 per year for those who are 50 years old or older. Um, so that's good. You know, Perhaps in 2022, it would be increased to 1100 or 1200 or maybe they'll do it in $500 increments or not. We'll, we'll wait and see. But that is certainly a positive because, again, you have a choice. If you have the money and if you want to make that contribution, presumably you'll do it. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Now, here's when it gets interesting. Um, the you know, employer plan catch-up contributions, um, the limits on those ca catch-up contributions are going to be increased, but only for those who are 62, 63, and 64 years old beginning in 2023. So this particular group, 62, 63, and 64, uh, for some reason, they're, they're currently excluding people who are 60, 61, 65, and, and older. Uh, and what's also interesting about it, well, I guess I'll, I'll talk about the increase itself. Um, it's going to be 
$10,000. Again, these are your catch-up contributions into your 401k and similar plans, such as 403Bs. Um, currently, it's 6,500. And if you have a simple IRA, it will be $5,000. And currently, it's um, $3,000. Now, the interesting part about it, uh, about it is that all catch-up contributions to a qualified retirement plans must now be made as Roth or after-tax contributions. So this, this whole idea of Rothifications. So essentially what's happening now, regardless if you fit in that category or not, if you're 62 or 61, your catch-up contributions has to be after-tax. So let's let's talk about it. Let's say you know you're in your prime earnings years, right? 60 to 70, which is the case for most people. You're really trying to catch up and save more for retirement. So by making, let's say, traditional pre-tax contributions, you're getting a tax break for the entire amount. So perhaps as a result of that, you can save even more in your brokerage account, right? Because there is a tax break. Under the new rules you can deduct up to 19 and a half thousand, which is your normal contribution, but the catch up amount, let's say it's 6,500 or 10,000, again, if you're 62, 63 or 64, is not tax deductible. It goes into your Roth IRA. So when I thought about this, I actually changed my opinion. Um, I don't think this is such a great rule. I actually don't think it's such a great change. Why am I saying that? Because currently you have a choice and 75% of plans actually give you that option. You can, let's say, direct 50% of your contributions, you know, traditional 401k, 50% into the Roth. Now you have less of a choice. Now, again, the catch-up portion needs to go into your um, Roth 401k. Now, very briefly for those of you who perhaps operate those plans, um, so assuming, again, it passes, if your plan does not allow for Roth contributions, well, you would need to amend your plan most likely um, to add that. That again applies to 25% of the plans. And then there'll be new accounts created, new um, SIP, uh, I'm sorry, SEP and simple um, IRA accounts, uh, or Roth accounts, I'm sorry, they currently do not exist. Um, so back to Rothification, and I just wanted to make this point. Um, very frequently, when we talk about traditional or regular, I should say, Roth conversions, we get that question. Well, we do the conversion now, we pay taxes now, but what is going to happen 10, 15, you know, maybe 20 years down the road? Will they actually tax our uh, um, Roth IRAs or Roth 401 case? Well, with this whole tra transition to Rothification, perhaps, perhaps it's now safer to do the Roth conversions. And again, this is a little speculative here, but this is the trend we're seeing that you know, Roth accounts um, would become perhaps more preferred vehicles versus traditional um, um, retirement accounts. Uh, in terms of the qualified longevity annuity contracts or QLACs, um, this is perhaps a busy slide, but we're actually not going to spend that much time on this simply because this rules only apply to very few 401k or similar plans. But you know, to be complete, we'll talk about this. Essentially what this does, it allows you to defer under the Secure Act 2.0 up to $135,000 of your account balance um, into a deferred annuity um, all the way to age 85. Well, why would you wanna do this? Let's say again, you're 65 years old, um, you're about to retire and you don't necessarily need that much money um, from your 401k account. So you would you know, take advantage of the QLAC provision to defer your distributions. And as a result of that, your RMDs and related taxes all the way to age 85. Um, if this is something you want to talk about, feel free to reach out to us. But again, relatively few people will likely benefit from that. And with that, uh, Judy, what else is important? Thanks, Alex. Um, the next thing we're gonna be addressing is the qualified charitable distribution rules. Um, under the current law, uh, an individual can basically make a direct um, contribution to their charity out of their IRA for a maximum amount of $100,000 in a year. Um, they must be age 70 and a half. And um, it's a beautiful way for tax planning uh, to basically 
um, escape the ordinary income taxation on that required minimum distribution that you would otherwise be taking because by giving it directly to the IRA, uh, you're essentially um, making that taxable event zero. Now, you can't also double dip and claim a charitable deduction for that amount, um, but this is one way of being able to manage your tax brackets and being able to um, you know, meet your charitable um, goals and avoid taxation on the RMD that you um, are required to take but may not basically be needing to take. Now, um, under the SECURE Act 2, that 100,000 would be indexed for inflation, which one of the articles uh, I read indicated it would be roughly $130,000. And um, interesting that they also added this provision, a one time, one time meaning one time in the lifetime is the way I read it, of the individual um, would be able to make a qualified charitable distribution to a split interest entity, which is basically defined as the charitable remainder annuity trust, the charitable remainder unity, unit trusts, and the charitable gift annuities. Uh, solely funded via the qualified charitable distribution. And it would be 50,000. 50, I read also that it could be 100,000 for married individuals. Now, the reality is um, it's typically the big universities and large nonprofits that have uh, attorneys and actuaries on staff that set up these um, crats and cruts for individuals. And um, there's costs associated with establishing the plans. There's costs established, uh, associated with maintaining them. So um, it seems a little bit unlikely that this particular provision will be um, really effective for many individuals, but uh, we did want to, to include that and let you know that's part of um, the SECURE Act too. Next slide, please. Okay, prohibited transactions. <laughs> Um, I get questions at least once a year, uh, sometimes more frequently, about individuals that are interested in uh, essentially self-investing their IRAs. Um, and there are prohibited transactions that one can have in their IRAs, specifically no self-dealing. You cannot self-deal within your IRA, uh, no personal use, which is essentially self-dealing. Um, no investments in collectibles and no investments in life insurance. Um, these are examples of the big kind of four no-nos um, on the prohibited transactions. And under current law, if you uh, have just $1, $1 of IRA funds that result in what's been deemed to be a prohibited transaction, the entire IRA amount uh, would be subject to um, income tax as if it was distributed. Um, and penalties. So it's it's a very, very punitive uh, situation to be in. What the SECURE Act 2 would do would reduce that penalty and taxation uh, to only the dollar amount that was involved uh, of the prohibited transaction, um, not to the actual total account. So um, that is prohibited transactions. Now, the next one, uh, Alex, if you want to move on to Qualified student. This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so basically, you know, everybody knows that uh, you know student debt is just an enormous burden uh, on our young adults, and this provision is intended to basically assist um, employees who may not otherwise be able to save for retirement because they're making you know payments to their overwhelming student debt. Um, I like this. This is this is basically saying that the employer can make a contribution to the you should underline employees retirement plan. So it's the it's essentially the employer making the the pre tax employee deferral payment on behalf of the employee, um, assuming you know they must provide proof that they you know have made the student loan payments. Um, and so it's a way to help basically, you know, young adults that are strapped with, you know, high debts to still be able to contribute to retirement. Now, um, as an accountant, of course, I was thinking, well, how's this going to work? There's, uh, you know, there's there's top heavy tests and, and, you know, how would the employer match work and, 
you know, how, how is this going to impact the actual um, retirement plan administration, if you will? Um, they did make a carve out. They said that this this match um, for the qualified student loan payments would be disaggregated uh, for purposes of like the average deferral percentage testing um, for retirement plans. So I think this is very, very positive um, and ho hope that this you know stays in the final bill um, if and when it's passed. So we're going to take just a, a quick break to ask if there's any questions so far on this, the, uh, we, Alex calls it the Secure Act 2, some of us call it the Son of Secure. <laughs> um, are there any questions at this time? Because we're going to be moving on to just a, another topic about looming tax increases um, in 2022 and beyond. In fact, we do have one question, and uh, maybe Joe mentioned this earlier, but please ask your questions in the chat box. I will read them out loud. We'll address them, but we'll not mention your name for privacy purposes. So here's one. It's actually for, for me, apparently. On the required catch-up contribution going into your Roth IRA, what if your income is over the contribution limit? So uh, great question. Let me clarify. So the... Um, in, in terms of the catch-up contributions going to uh, into the Roth portion of your account, that only applies to qualified or employer-sponsored plans. That does not apply to traditional IRAs. So essentially, my my understanding is it, it would be essentially the same thing in terms of your IRA contributions. The only difference, the only change, which I would say is a positive change, is the fact that your um, catch-up contributions would be indexed for inflation. So. I hope that addresses your question. Uh, someone else raised his hand. <laughs> There's a function. Uh, so please ask your question if you raised your hand. Um, again, I'm not going to mention your name. Um, I'm not sure they can uh, because they can't. Or they could ask it in the chat box, right? Correct. Yeah, yes. And just, yeah. just to confirm, at least under our current format, um, we do not allow our participants to you know, talk basically. So please ask your question in the chat box if you don't mind. All right. Uh, so should we move Moving to the on. next chapter? Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. So uh, Alex and I love to talk about tax and financial planning. It's like our, our favorite thing to do. We couldn't pass up this opportunity because um, the American Families Plan is hot and heavy right now in Washington, D.C., um, in fact, I want to challenge our, our, our uh, participants to put in the chat box uh, answer to this question. Who do you think the busiest people are in Washington, D.C. right now? And while you answer that, I'm going to just, gonna just give a little caveat here. Um, the House of Representatives passed a $3.5 trillion um, budget resolution last week on August 24th. Um, and what that does essentially is it, it, it gives the nod for the committees to now go to work um, to determine how to pay for it. And what we're going to be talking about is what some of the floating ideas are um, about how to pay for the $3.5 trillion budget. Now, um, just some background, if they want to pass it on resolution, um, the Democrats have to get all 50 Democratic senators to vote for it. And then the vice president would cast the tie-breaking vote. And if you recall, in 2017, um, the Republicans did the same thing when they basically passed the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. They passed it in late November of 2017. We were all scrambling to figure out tax planning um, and obviously how to comply with tax return preparation that following year. Um, so that's what they're working towards. Um, any, did we get answers in the chat box, Alex, on? who the busiest people are in not, Washington? Not no? yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'll tell you who they are. They are the Congressional Budget Office staffers who basically have to, for every proposal that comes up as to how to pay for this budget, they have to crunch the numbers and you know, kind of give their yay or nay and, and say you know, what, how much money it would raise. So they're very busy. Um, obviously, um, the House and Ways, Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, those people, uh, staffers are very, very busy. And the lobbyists, um, Washington Post just had an article yesterday about all the lobbyists lining up um, to uh, 
to, to, to give their input about what should pass. And as we go through this, I want to say we are nonpartisan here, Alex and I. Uh, this is strictly this is just to give you the information straight from the horse's mouth as to what we see uh, as potentially coming down the road. Um, I will add some commentary about, you know, what is more likely to happen or not, but this is, we're, we're not taking any uh, partisan um, tact on it. So, okay, so increase to the high uh, income taxpayers. I think everybody knows this, it's, it's probably likely to happen. Um, the Tax Cuts and Job Tax Tax Cut and Jobs Act in 2017 reduced the highest income tax rate from 39.6 to 37. Essentially, this would unwind that. It's going to unwind anyway uh, after 2025 because it's scheduled to sunset. In part because of that resolution, they had to figure out how to pay for the the act, uh, and one way to do that was to sunset that. The, the tax rate. So this would unwind that um, top top rates would go back up to 39.6 starting in 2022. Probably likely that that will be included. The corporate tax rate is a different story. Um, it's at 21% now. Uh, the American Jobs Plan is recommending it to be at 28%. Um, uh, Senator Menchkin, I hope I say that right, from West Virginia, um, he's one of the holdouts on the Democratic side in the Senate. Uh, he is pushing to, to a highest rate of 25%. And um, from what my reading is, it is likely that it will be some something between 21 and 28 and quite likely maybe 25% as a corporate tax rate. Um, capital gains rates and dividend rates. Um, okay, so the proposal would be that capital gains would be taxed at ordinary rates, the 39.6% uh, percent rate with incomes over a million dollars. So essentially they would lose their identity as an investment gain that um, we have a nice slide where I'll be going over you that, that basically allowed for taxation at lower rates. Um, they would just be treated now as ordinary, um, ordinary income essentially for those earning over um, a million dollars. That one also is in play from what I uh, what I have been reading. Um, it may possibly more, be more like a 25 to 28% rate because um, that's a pretty hard cliff to fall off of uh, after a million dollars. But um, so that's that's the capital gains rate. The NIT tax, um, it's uh, the net investment income tax it has been part of the law. It was originally helped to uh, pay for the Obamacare um, tax and it is applied to investment income. Now um, it's proposed that it would be apply uh, for income over $400,000 and uh, it would essentially raise the highest capital gain rate up to 43.4. So it would be the 39.6 plus the 3.8 um, uh, NIT tax. And then uh, recently, um, Senator Van Hollen, who's from Maryland, and Congressman Beyer from Virginia, they have put forth the millionaire surtax proposal, which would apply an additional 10% tax to incomes. Um, it's a million dollars per single. It would be $2 million for married filing joint, and it would apply equally to wages and salaries, as well as capital gains and other investment income. So it's a way of essentially you know, taking a, a slice off, off of the very um, uh, top income uh, earners. Next slide, please. So here's a graph um, prepared um, that helps to show if you're filing single or married filing jointly, how this would impact you. So let's look at the married filing joint for uh, the top part. So under current law, you know, there's the 10 through 37 percent tax brackets um, and the proposal would be that it would uh, at incomes of 400,000, that's the key, 400,000, um, you would go from a 32 percent rate to a 39.6 rate and essentially eliminating the 35 percent and the 37. Um, and for individuals, you'll see down below, again, it's the 400,000, but um, under the current 
it actually the 37 percent tax bracket doesn't creep in until uh, 500,000. So depending on where you fall on your taxable income, you know this will be um, those that are impacted by this proposed change. Um, one thing before we move on, um, in terms of tax planning, um, when we have a change in tax rates like this um, that we can plan for, and we hope they don't pass this on the, you know, the 23rd of December, um, what can you do? Well, of course, you can accelerate income that you would otherwise earn um, in 2022 to 2021. Uh, if you have that flexibility, you can defer expenses. Um, you can engage in Roth transactions, as Alex was explaining, if it makes sense. Right now, the market is very high, which means those IRAs accounts are very high. Um, so obviously, you need to go through, you know, the, the, the question as to, you know, does it make sense to do so or not? But um, anytime we're looking at higher tax brackets in the future, uh, it begs the question to uh, what can you do now to take advantage of the lower, lower tax brackets that are in place at the moment. Next slide, please. This um, is a chart showing the impact on long-term capital gains. Um, I like this because it helps to uh, illustrate the capital gains really are taxed at many different rates, depending on um, your filing status and how much income you earn. So for example, if we look at uh, a single person, um, they're gonna pay zero, that's that green, zero tax on long-term capital gains if their uh, income is up to 40,400. Now between 40,400 and 455, 445,850, um, they're gonna be in that blue, which is the 15% long-term rate, but they're also gonna be hit with that NIT, NIT tax, the 3.8 NIT um, to the extent their income is over $200,000. After 445,850, they jump to the 20% long-term rate, um, and then over a million dollars, it would be at the 39.6 rate. Um, and you can see how that flows through for um, the different filing status. Um, again, from plan planning standpoint, uh, timing of sales. I think you know the real estate market has you know, been on fire this year. Uh, a lot of people buying second homes, a lot of people um, selling their primary residences and um, taking advantage of the lower capital gain rates this year. If you know you're planning on selling your home um, is a good idea as opposed to waiting until next year. If you fall, if you find that you fall, your, you, that you may fall under these um, tax uh, brackets. Um, harvesting losses, obviously we're, we're always busy in the later half of the year to try to make sure that we harvest losses to offset capital gains. Um, investing in retirement, of course, um, so that you are, you know, you're deferring your income um, and therefore the gains on, on that deferral are also deferred. And um, just trimming income in terms of um, not just retirement plan contributions, but um, health savings accounts, 529 plans, um, and other tax advantage um, vehicles. Next slide, please. Okay, um, here's, a, here's another one I think is quite controversial. Um, there is a proposal to eliminate the tax deduction for employee 401k contributions and replacing it with a tax credit. Now, the reason for this is uh, to equalize the benefit across uh, Americans. Um, someone, for example, who um, is in the, say, 28% tax bracket, when they make a deferral into their retirement plan, right, they're essentially getting a, a, a tax benefit of 28% plus their state. Um, and uh, another individual may be in the 10% tax bracket, and they're making that same contribution to their uh, employee um, deferral plan, and they're only getting a 10% um, break instead of a 28% break. So it's meant to equalize the value of that deferral by replacing it with a tax credit, which would be the same credit regardless as to what your income situation would be. Um, now, uh, before I reach the 28% cap, let's just just move forward to the SALT deduction. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in, in 2017, you know, re 
put a cap on the state and local income tax deduction at ten thousand dollars oh people screamed and and hollered because you know in maryland and new york and um a lot of the states where there are um high personal property taxes plus obviously state income taxes people lost a, a huge deduction on the return um now the alternative minimum tax you know dampened that a little bit but still um, people definitely lost a, a, a large deduction so uh, under the American Families Plan, the proposal is to, um, I'm sorry, it's not the American Plan, but it is, it is being talked about on the Hill, would be to allow the SALT deduction and would be um, something that would be uh, reinstated. Um, however, that would mean that more people would itemize again instead of taking the larger standard deduction, and therefore um, the proposal is to put a 28% cap on the tax benefit from itemized deductions. Um, there probably, you know, I think the the salt deduction uh, will the cap will be removed. Um, I think it's pretty popular to do so. Uh, and you know, the twenty eight percent cap, we've had caps before on itemized deductions before in our tax code, and and that may be a way of um, you know kind of accommodating um, both sides of the aisle, if you will. Next slide, please. Okay, um, with regard to um, estate planning. Uh, the repeal of the stepped up basis at death. This is being talked about. Um, essentially, it would exclude up to um, 1 million for individuals and 2.5 million for married filing joint, uh, assuming that they also take the, two, the 250,000 exclusion for sale of real estate. So that would be 500,000 for joint. So um, they would ex exclude everybody in the one million or two and a half million. Uh, therefore, everything above that, unless it's given to charity, uh, would be would repeal the step up. Now, what is the step up? Essentially, when someone dies, um, their heirs inherit the value of their assets at a stepped up basis, which is the fair market value at date of death. And um, the argument here is that there's a lot of uh, fortunes, if you will, that have made over the years as people have lived longer that they have in um, their homes, they might have in their, their portfolios, that they've had these large gains that have never been taxed um, and they escape tax because um, the individuals inherit them at a stepped up basis. So this is a proposal to repeal that stepped up basis except for um, this one million and two and a half million exclusion. The reality is it's hugely unpopular and it's very hard for as a tax accountant to implement because many people don't even know what their basis is. They, they don't know historically what they paid for their home or how much improvements they made to their home. I mean, people that are dying now that have owned their homes for 60 years, they, they just don't have that information. Um, and same um, before the cost basis was required to be um, maintained by the brokerage houses. A lot of people own stocks. They don't know what they originally bought it for. Um, you know, so it's from a just logistic standpoint, it's, it's, it's hugely unpopular to try to actually implement this. Um, so we'll see whether or not that that ends up in the final uh, legislation. Now, in terms of the federal state exemption, um, currently, uh, the exemption is, is $10 million per individual index for inflation, which means it's about $11.7 million now. What this means is if somebody dies for federal tax purposes, um, their estate does not get taxed uh, until it exceeds that exemption, um, less obviously gifts made during, during their li lifetime. Um, this is scheduled to sunset already at the end of 2025 and revert back to a base limit of 5 million per individual, which is expected to be around 6.4 million uh, index for inflation in 2026. Um, the proposal uh, that Biden has uh, is that the exemption would be reduced to 3.5 million. So that's a significant reduction from the current uh, 11. Uh, 0.7 million would be reduced to three and a half million um, and the estate tax rate 
for amounts uh, that apply after that exemption would be increased from 40 to 45 percent. Now, I've had conversations with quite a few estate attorneys uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. And um, uh, uh, when I asked the question, who are the most busy people in Washington, besides those uh, legislators and lobbyists, it's the estate attorneys. And I've seen it with a lot of clients myself. They're redoing their estate planning. Uh, they're giving away their houses to Cuperts. Um, you know, they're setting up um, uh, irrevocable trusts for life insurance. They they are engaging actively in trying to shed um, monies from their estate because they anticipate that this uh, estate exemption will be reduced. Um, on the other hand, I talked to an attorney just the other day, uh, head of the estate and trust practice at a local law firm, and he said, he didn't think it was going to happen and that they would just wait for it to sunset. So uh, yeah. Yeah. time will time will tell. But I think, you know, purpose of our webinar today is, you know, Alex and I love to we love to talk about this and we love to keep people informed. And this is very real. So, you know, if you have a, a large estate or your parents do, um, you know, these are things to think about and talk to, you know, your financial planner. Um, and a state attorney about because it's it's real. That's right. I think so. Next up, okay. Uh, so yes, we have some questions or frequently asked questions, including um, a couple that were submitted to us prior to the webinar. But perhaps we should first address those from the chat box. Um, what do you think, Judy? Um, so here's one from the chat box. Um, it says, "Is the sixty-five hundred um, dollar catch-up?" for 401 case going away for those outside of age 62 slash 54. Well, what, what this person really meant to say is um, six, outside of the 62 to 64 age. Uh, age. No, uh, it does not. And that is what's actually interesting about it. Um, if you're 50 years old, right? 50, 51 and going forward, um, the, the catch up contribution will remain the same. You would need to make it into your into the Roth portion of your 401k, but it remains the same $6,500. Once you reach your 62nd birthday, all the way to age 64, it's going to be 10,000. And then it's going to revert back to 65. I mean, that's that's how we're reading it. And that, again, in terms of you know my thoughts, in terms of what would be adjusted, perhaps that's going to be one of those things in terms of the practical implementation. Right. You know, your people are so used to they hit that age 50. Right. And they can start making those catch up contributions. But now they would need to remember that they need to increase them. And then, you know, once they're 65 year, years old, they would need to reduce them again. Just doesn't make um, that much sense to me. But no, they're not going away. They're just not going to be in, um, uh, increased. Uh, the next question here is, do we expect to see any changes to or to verification of the beneficiary payout rules? Um, Judy, would you like to address this question? Beneficiary payout um, in, in terms of IRAs? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I entirely understand that question. So in terms of the SECURE Act um, or the son of the SECURE, it does not address that. So it doesn't change. Oh, I um, think may maybe that's referring to the stretch. The no, stretch, I okay. I did not see anything. So, you know, if when you look at the Rothification and the stretch and even what's happening with the proposed changes in the tax law, ultimately, um, uh, the Congress is, you know, they're they're trying to they're trying to get current dollars into the Treasury now, right. right? And and to do so, they're saying, well, you know, we'll we'll allow this tax free treatment in the future, but we need the money now, you know, because they love people doing these Roth conversions because it's putting oh, yeah. money into the Treasury right now. Um, and the elimination of the stretch. Um, is exactly that thing. It's accelerating the collection of tax um, on on inherited right. IRAs, um, and the reduction, proposed reduction in the estate tax. You know, again, it's getting getting money in now. Um, the the elimination of the um, step up. So it's all about how do we get more money into the treasury now, and and not necessarily thinking about what the ramifications are in the future. And that and that. What raising the question that Alex brought up is, well, what if 
what if sometime down the future, you know, in the future, we have, you know, new representatives uh, and they don't think the same about Ross? Are they going to start right. taxing them? Oh, you know, I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So a couple more questions from the chat box. Uh, I believe these are mostly about the second part of our uh, webinar. Is it only those with income over 1 million that will be affected by the proposed change in capital gains, or will there be no special capital gain rate and all capital gains are taxed as ordinary income? Just the high income at the moment. It's just as that slide, Alex, you want to go back? Um, uh, Which one? No, no, that one. Yeah. So this is put together by Smart Asset, um, but it's it's for those earning over um, over a million dollars that that would hit at the 39.6. Again, this is all this is still being proposed, and uh, as I was saying, the Congressional Budget Office is cranking numbers. As is the, you know the Senate Finance Committee, they have to figure out how to pay for this uh, 3.5 trillion dollar um, budget resolution that they want to pass. So, you know, this is all subject to to, to change. And as I mentioned earlier, it's likely, at least articles I've read, it's likely that maybe the capital gains rate would just change maybe to 25 to 28 percent, and maybe that would be at a lower tax threshold. All right, I guess a similar question, I'll just read it and perhaps you already addressed it. Uh, would the capital gains apply to all funds once you exceed 1 million or the amounts over 1 million? Um, well, we, our, our tax structure is progressive, meaning that uh, it's uh, it's incremental until you get one million. So it wouldn't just you wouldn't fall off a cliff and everything be at the thirty nine point six. At least not that's not how I read it. You'd still be in these brackets as shown in the slide, and then the amount over that in excess would be taxed that's, at ordinary rates. That's typically how the tax system works in the, in our progressive system. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. Um, if deductions were capped at twenty eight percent. How would that inter interrelate with the ability to make an RMD contribution, which may be more than 28%? Um, so the 28% cap would be on itemized deductions. So your itemized deductions are your state and local income taxes, real estate taxes, um, your mortgage interests, your charitable contributions, and medical. If, if they qualify. So you add all those up and it would be 20, uh, 28%. Now, the extent that you're able to reduce your um, ordinary income by making a qualified charitable distribution, that would impact the uh, the 28%, right? Because 28% of a lower amount as opposed to a higher amount. Hope I answered that question for you. Sounds good. Here's, a, I guess, a more complex question I, I only partially understand and I'm not even sure we can address it but I'll read it just just to acknowledge it and maybe we can discuss it offline um, does the RMD have to be taken by account TIN number or can the RMD be taken from any account with multiple TIN numbers numbers presumably for example if you have marital Q-tip and marital non-Q-tip accounts can you take the RMD from just one of these or does it have to be taken from Q-tip Q-tip and non-Q-tip um, uh, well, typically um, the RMDs uh, you can take them from whatever account as long as you as long as you take the amount that you need to take. Um, I'll defer to Alex, who does more of the well, uh, the day to day so management. <laughs> I, I will give you a general answer, and again, feel free to reach out offline. Maybe we can talk about this more. You can aggregate by account type. Uh, meaning if you have a SEP IRA and a traditional IRA, and let's say in your SEP IRA, you have a $10,000 RMD and your traditional, let's say 20, you can take 30,000 from one of those. You don't have to take it from, from each if you don't want to, but you cannot aggregate with qualified accounts. So if you also have a 401k and you have a $50,000 RMD on that 401k, it needs to come out of your 401k, not from your IRA. So uh, if you have multiple 401ks, it needs to come from multiple 401ks. You cannot aggregate it and take it from only one. Um, I don't think that necessarily addresses the question um, that, that is being asked here. So perhaps again, we should take it offline. 
Um, all right. So in I terms wanna, of yeah, I did want to get to this. At least, yeah. um, will the Secure Act be passed? I think that's a good question. Um, so the um, Secure Act two, it's HR twenty nine fifty four, um, was uh, passed by the House Ways and Means Committee. So not by the full House, but actually just the Ways and Means, means Committee in May of twenty twenty one. So it has to pass the House and then move on to the the Senate. Now. It did have a unanimous vote um, in the House Ways and Means Committee, and the Secure Act itself passed um, in 2019 with a 417 to three vote. So um, it's popular, whether or not it actually, um, you know, they, they're so busy right now with the infrastructure bill and now this budget resolution. Um, this is probably definitely on a back burner, but um, it is generally uh, popular on both sides of the aisle, and um, I would hope that they could get it done by the end of the year. That is, again, based on what I've been reading, um, some articles even assign the probability, you know, sometimes they assign a percentage. Um, some of them are saying it's 90% chance. So be as it may, but from what I hear, uh, there's a high probability. Um, second question, Judy, if you uh, Yep, to... if the Biden administration reduces the estate tax exemptions in the new legislation, what are the recommended steps uh, to take to reduce the value of an estate to minimize the tax impact? So um, currently there is a 15,000 per person um, gift tax exclusion. What that means is um, you can gift 15,000 um, per person and not file a gift tax return and not declare that you're using up part of your uh, estate exemption um, for that 15,000 gift. And it's unlimited. I mean, if you have as many people you want to distribute to, you can do 15,000 per person. So that's one way of getting money out of your estate. Um, setting up an irrevocable trust, particularly for life insurance, because a lot of people don't think life insurance is included in their estate, but it is. And if you have a million dollar life insurance policy, um, you know, you would set that up in an, in an irrevocable life insurance trust and, and therefore bypass the estate. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm having clients um, tell me they are funding a, a QPERT, which is a qualified personal residence trust. Literally, they're moving their personal residence into um, an irrevo irrevocable trust and taking that out of their estate. Um, and then those that are into real estate, um, you know, family limited partnerships have, is long time practice of being able to um, basically um, move real estate into a family um, partnership and reduce the value of the um, of the property for the for the usually the parent, if you will, um, in their estate. So. Um, I would recommend talking to your financial planner and your estate uh, attorney if you think that you might um, be impacted by this uh, reduction to three and a half million for the uh, estate exemption. By the way, the District of Columbia is already down to two million. Um, they they did that this year. So you know, some people, even though they have a large federal exemption, they think, oh, this doesn't apply to me. But if you live in the District of Columbia, it very much does. Thank you, Judy. So uh, questions three and four, I should be able to address them really quickly. Uh, when and how could I withdraw my RMDs pertaining to the SECURE Act? So assuming it passes as it stands today, if you are 65 or older, it would be either 73 or 74. Again, you can refer back to the earlier slide. If you're 64 years old today or younger, it would be 75 years old. And in terms of how, well, you would reach out to the institution that holds your funds, you know, your 401k provider or your brokerage firm. Um, they would normally calculate that amount for you. And then you'd simply decide when you want to take it out. If you want to take it earlier in the year, throughout the year, or perhaps, you know, closer to the end of the year to, um, you know, defer um, for tax purposes as much as possible. Uh, and the final question, not sure if it's necessarily related to our presentation today, but it was asked, um, how much money should one person save be before he or she can retire comfortably? The answer is, of course, it depends. It depends on your personal circumstances. Um, there are some rules of thumb. I'm happy to discuss them briefly today, but usually, again, would want to run a projection to estimate it based on your specific situation. So uh, 10 to 12 percent 
uh, 10 to 12 times, I'm sorry, of your pre-retirement income is one rule of thumb. So if you're 65 years old, you're earning $100,000 a year, you would want to have somewhere between a million to 1.2 million saved for retirement. Again, that's just a rule of thumb because then you have the funds plus your social security and presumably it's going to cover 60 to 70% of your, again, pre-retirement retirement income. Um, the, the other way of thinking about it is actually very similar is the so-called uh, 4% rule. So you can safely draw um, up to 4% from your retirement accounts. So let's say you want to have $40,000 when you retire. Well, as a result of that, you need to have at least a million dollars um, to afford that. Plus, of course, um, your social security income. So but my short answer is it depends. <laughs> right. So uh, we have some upcoming um, events we just wanted to share with you. Um, and thank you for participating today. We we love uh, we love these events and sharing our uh, knowledge and information with you. Um, we have the following upcoming: um, the Certified Nonprofit Accounting Professional Training. We refer to it as CNAPS. It's wonderful training for um, anyone working in the nonprofit world. Um, grow your net worth: uh, top strategies and opportunities for mid-career professionals. Uh, we have three of the that series. One is for um, young professionals, uh, the mid-career, and then Alex and I will be post-career or um, pre and post retire pre and post uh, yeah. on November 2nd. And then um, new, which we haven't done, um, this will be a new webinar on October 14th, um, is a employee benefits and executive benefits, what professional service firms um, need to know. So please join us um, for those events. And uh, we have um, a coronavirus a resource center um, on our CBM website at the cbm.com slash cbm slash coronavirus COVID-19. And thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you attending. Much. And if you want to contact us, uh, here's our information. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the beautiful day. Take care.